Okay, so how is everyone today? Good, I hope. Chugging right along. <laughs> okay, today's the 14th. Can you believe it? Okay, so last time we left by defining, uh, by defining the integral. <coughs> so specifically what we had defined was ln of f, un of f, l of f, u of f. So, uh, briefly, <coughs> what we said was is, We'll cut up the whole, uh, so we have, we've got a function, f from rn to r, a function which accepts vector inputs and produces scalar outputs, and it must be bw, bs. What does that mean? Bounded with bounded support. So we, we defined this, uh, defined this to say, okay, we will consider the dyadic paving uh, of all of Rn into little bitty cubes, but do understand that cubes, uh, in the case of, of if the inputs are scalars, if it's from R to R, then what kind of thing is a cube? An interval. Uh, and if it's from R2 to R, what kind of thing is a cube? A square. And then if it's from R3, it's really a cube. So, so understand that cube means, means in cube. Uh, we we uh, compute the lower sum of f uh, over all the cubes at resolution n. That's what this one is. This one is the upper sum of f over all cubes at resolution n. What is this one? The limit as the resolution becomes infinite. Uh, the, the limit of the, the lower one. This one similarly is the limit of, of, of the upper sum <coughs> as the resolution becomes infinite. And then finally we left last time with the definition of integral. So what is the definition of, of integral? It's not the difference. I'm sorry? Yes, when, when both of these exist and when they are equal, their common value uh, is denoted integral over Rn of f and then inside of absolute value looking things, dn, x. So that should give you uh, uh, an echo of what, what integrals looked like to you before. Uh, but notice, for example, if in that, in that above definition, rn is r, which is to say, what if, what if we're in the scalar calculus case, then the way that this is denoted is uh, like this. So the, the integral over r of f dx. So it looks like, looks like what you did, uh, that what you already knew. <coughs> However, we have this uh, absolute value around the dx, which is a little, <coughs> a little bit weird. So, uh, However, because of, a, because of an interesting uh, quirk, this is going to be exactly equal to uh, the, the integral that you already know, uh, the integral over all of R of f dx, writing it without absolute value. But the reason that's going to occur, the reason that's going to occur uh, is that wh what this absolute value notation, th it's not absolute value. But what the notation is, is signifying, it's signifying something about notation. Uh, and in the case, uh, sorry, not, it's not signifying something about notation. It is denoting uh, something about orientation. So in the case that the inputs are scalars and the outputs are scalars, that means that it makes sense to consider whether or not the orientation of the input is preserved or reversed. Right? Remember how we were talking about uh, for example, in, in the plane, a parallelogram can be oriented. But in space, a two parallelogram cannot be oriented. It doesn't have an orientation. 
Okay, good. So we'll, we'll, we'll deal more with that later. I just want you to know that that absolute value is, is somehow significant, and we're going to have to deal with it uh, later. Good. So a few propositions. Well, let's make a remark first. Uh, about inf and soup. Okay, so let's consider, uh, let's consider uh, x <coughs> is a subset of the reals. x is some, sub, sub, some subset of the reals, uh, and a is a particular element of the reals. So x is a subset and a is a particular uh, uh, element in the reals. We're going to define ax to be the set of all ax such that little x is an x. So what that means is that when I, when I say a scalar times a set, for example, if we had some set and I said twice that set, what I mean is take all of the elements in that set and multiply them by two. That's what that means. So for example, uh, if we had the set, uh, say, I don't know, five to, uh, five to eight, if this was our set, then we could plot it like so. So uh, if this is zero, Five to eight. Then what would two x be? Ten to sixteen. <coughs> Something like this. Okay, so as a result, uh, as a result, suppose that we uh, that we have some some set X is a subset of the reals. Uh, let's consider the set uh, negative X. So just a straight straightforward. What is so? Do you see that this is an application of the previous definition? So what I mean is just take all the elements in that set and negate them. So in particular, uh, visually, as particular examples, suppose that uh, here is the origin right here. That's the origin. And suppose that I say that x is this set I'm coloring in red. So suppose that this is x, that point and, and that little uh, segment. What is negative x? It's the reflection of that set, right, across the origin. So right here and right here. So for, for the red set, for the red set, uh, in the first place, you can, you can see that the red set is bounded. Nothing, it, uh, it eventually, you know, it has an upper bound, it has a lower bound. Where is the soup of the red set? It's right here. So this is the this is the soup of set X, and where is the inf? It's that one, right? Okay, and then where is the soup of the green set? Yeah, this one right here, right? soup of negative x. Okay, so that's the soup of negative x. Uh, and this one would be the nth of negative x. <laughs> Supposing that the red is x and the green is its reflection. Uh, well, so this is, this is an illustration of, of uh, something. So in particular, suppose that we had not this, not this specific set, but now any set. Uh, that, that uh, is like this. Um, 
if, if I ask what is the soup of negative x, then this is also equal to something else. Yeah, it's the, it's the negation of the inf of x. <coughs> So what I, what I want you to observe, in a sense, is that uh, if you consider scalar multiplication of sets in this, in this definition, when you factor negative outside of soup, uh, it becomes nth. S sim similarly, uh, the, the other way around, which is to say, uh, what, is the, what is the nth of negative x? It's the negative soup of x. Okay, so then factoring negations out, in and out, uh, changes uh, inf to soup and vice versa. Okay, that's interesting. What if, <coughs> what if, uh, let's, let's define mm, in particular, uh, what do I want to say? So the oscillation on a set X, so can you <coughs> remind me what this is? So the oscillation of x is what? Soup minus nth. So this is uh, soup of x minus nth of x. OK, in that case, what is the oscillation <coughs> of negative x? Okay, well, we could use these algebraic rules, right? In a sense, we could just sort of uh, ignore the picture, just, just wrote, uh, apply the algebraic rules. Well, after all, this would be the soup of negative x and then minus the nth of negative x. But then we can use the rules that are immediately above, right? And we can factor, we can factor the negatives out. So if we factor the negation out of this one, what do we have? negative inf of x. And then if we factor the negative out of this one, it would be, this one becomes soup. And then of course if you distribute the, if you distribute the negatives and you also reorder, what is this? Same thing, Same thing right? Now, that, that's nice algebraically, uh, but I claim that that's a bit obvious. Why is it, uh, uh, visually, I, I claim it's a bit obvious, is what I mean to say. Why, why is that uh, a bit obvious? Right, you, you can kind of think of it like, well, there's some, there's some intrinsic width of this set, right? It's that much. <coughs> and then if we, if we reflect it across, across the origin, well, it's still, it, that doesn't change its width. That rigidly reflects it. So, yeah, okay, great. So any question about, uh, about this? Okay, now, <clears throat> what if we do something uh, a, little, a little weird? And I ask, okay, uh, if x, if x <coughs> is uh, a subset of the reals, uh, this is not a general notation. I just want to use it specifically for, for right here on this, this area of the page. Uh, by absolute value of x, I mean the set of all absolute value of x's such that x is an x. So specifically what I mean is that, like on the previous page where I said a scalar multiple of a set is take all the elements in the set and multiply them by that multiple like two. Here what I mean is by, by just, just here, by absolute value of the set, I mean take all the elements and compute their absolute value. Okay, so now uh, <coughs> we, we saw that negation of a set doesn't, does not change its oscillation. Negation of a set does not change its oscillation. Uh, now my question is, is what about absolute value of a set like this? Under what circumstance is the oscillation of that set uh, 
altered. Okay. So, <clears throat> so to be to be clear, what I want us to consider is the oscillation of the absolute value of x, the absolute value of set x. Well, there's two very easy cases. Uh, one easy case. One easy case is that if it so happens uh, that x is more than zero, well, I'll, I'll do less than zero. X is less than zero for all x in x. <coughs> now, this is an easy case. I claim this is an easy case. Why is this an easy case? It won't change it. It won't change it because, because if we have the number line here, and this is the origin. We're talking about a set X, which is entirely where? It's entirely on one side of the origin. So it's entirely, uh, entirely uh, in, in particular, on the left. So, so we're talking about some kind of set over here. <coughs> so you can clearly see it's, uh, at least on my particular drawing, you can see it's infant soup. And then the absolute value of that is equivalent to a reflection. Okay, so then, can, can we see that, in this case, oscillation would, would be identical? So in particular, uh, the oscillation of uh, absolute value of x is the same uh, as the oscillation of x. What's another case that, that is uh, trivial in, in an entirely analogous way? Right, when all of them are positive. <coughs> Okay, so similarly, if, if, if it is the case that uh, all of them are positive, so supposing that to be true, then the oscillation of the absolute value of x is uh, still the oscillation of x. Okay, now, so what's the last case? <coughs> so in fact, I can, I can make these slightly, slightly uh, better, right? So I can say less or equal. Uh, and this one equal, so that we're not, we're not just entirely leaving out zero. Okay, so now, now the question is, is well, what if we, what if we um, have a set that in some sense straddles the origin? <coughs> We've got some negative stuff, some positive stuff. Okay, then, then trying to visualize the transformation of taking a set x to its absolute value, that's like folding all of the negative things to be on top of the positive things, right? <clears throat> okay, so otherwise, that is to say, Some, uh, some x are uh, less or equal to zero, and some x are greater or equal to zero. So what's going to be, uh, what's going to be the case here? So, so, we're, so um, x, x is a set, right? So strictly speaking, it doesn't make sense to ask if a set is continuous. You might be, you, maybe you mean contiguous. Uh, so that is to say, is, is x an interval? And the answer is, it, it doesn't need to be. Yes? difference between those? Well, let's, let's consider. Let, 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 let's consider uh, a specific case. So how about, how about this set, negative 1 to 1, just, just to sort of get a feel for the, for the question. This is a symmetric interval, a negative 1 to 1. Uh, well, in that case, what it, in only, only on this here am I saying this absolute value of a set. Then what is the absolute value of this set? 0 to 1. Okay, 
What's the oscillation of this set? Two. What's the oscillation of this one? One. Similarly, uh, how about the set that only contains negative one and one? So I don't mean an interval. I mean the set that contains exactly the <coughs> point negative one and also exactly the point positive one. Then uh, the absolute value of this set uh, is what? Is the singleton one? So in this case, what is the oscillation? So what's the oscillation of this set? Two. two again, and then what's the oscillation of this one? Zero. So the oscillation is, is zero. Do we have to like I'm imagining like splitting the set up into, into halves and then seeing what the supremum is and then if R is this set, the supremum and infimum of this set R is about combining them. Is that like uh, we have to? Is it just the, the length, the, the larger of the two <coughs> absolute terms? Because if you have more on the negative side, you flip it over, and then it would go further. Like, let's say the negative side is larger than the positive side. Mm -hmm. Then your set would flip kind of over, and then that would extend beyond where you're positive. So then would it be that length? Or is the positive side larger than the positive side? OK. So I, I like that. So let's, <coughs> do you have a question? Okay. Yes? Um, it would just be the maximum of the absolute value of the infinite on the set or the absolute value of the supremum of the set. It would be the greater of the two. Well, what about in this case? Here the inf is negative one, the sup is one, so the oscillation is two. But for this set, the oscillation is zero. Remember, we're at, I'm asking about oscillation. Asking about oscillation. Okay, well, let, let's define, let's make a definition. So for set X, let's define set X with superscript, uh, with superscript negative. This is the set of all, of all X uh, in X such that uh, X is less or equal to zero. So what does this mean? This is the, this is the part of x, uh, which is, if you like, on the left side. So what am I going to define immediately after this? Yeah, and I'll denote it as this. OK, so that's, that's the part that happens to be on the right. So can we agree that this one will be unchanged? by the operation. <clears throat> it's, it's this one that gets uh, changed, yes? It's a small thing, but if you include zero in both intervals, is that going to affect anything? OK, it's, it's, a, it's a good question. So, so uh, you're, I, to, to, uh, to, to say you're concerned, maybe you're concerned that I might be counting zero twice. OK, so my, my uh, response to that is, is uh, how about, how about uh, these, these intervals? Uh, 0 to 1 and 0 to 1. So what is the, what is the infimum of this one? Zero. And this one? Zero. And the oscillation of this one? And this one? 1. So in a sense, what I'm, what I'm telling you is that infant soup, uh, they don't complain about a single point uh, as long as this point is on the boundary. Right. Uh, what I mean is that here's a set where the, where the soup is there, and I could, if that point was there, I could delete it, and the soup would not be changed. But if I was to put a point right there, then the soup would change. Okay. But what I'm saying is that uh, this, this, uh, this uh, single point w w won't be a problem. Yeah, I, what I'm saying is it's just not going to matter. Okay, so then, <clears throat> so then uh, well... Now I lost track of what I was saying. So, so this part is the only part uh, that's going to move. Okay. So, so in particular, uh, for this one, suppose uh, we could write, uh, we could consider the nth of of this and the soup of this. 
So where, where are these two points going to go? So wh where, wherever, the, wherever this one is, so the nth of the negative part is going to become this, the, the soup of the negation of the infinite, uh, of, the, of the negative part. Right, so this one is going to go, uh, on, on its reflection, it's going to become, uh, well, nth of negative x will be uh, soup, N negative soup of x negative. <coughs> right, and a similar statement for, for this one. So, uh, specifically, the soup of the reflected part of this part is the negation of the nth of this part. Okay. So now, let's, this part has, has its infant soup. Uh, this part has in its infant soup. Now let's let's watch how they reflect. <clears throat> so, in particular, <coughs> suppose that, uh, for sake of argument, uh, we have say this one and uh, this one. <coughs> So this is going to be the, the nth of the non-negative part and the soup of the non-negative part. And this will be the uh, soup of the non-positive <coughs> part. And then do you want this green point to be close or far away? Far? Okay. So what I mean is that this one is further than that one. So under reflection, the red ones will be stationary. Where will this green one go? Just on the inside of this one, right? OK, and then where will this green one go? Right, to the, so over here, uh, just eyeballing it. Okay, so then what, so for this, for when, with the non-positive uh, non part reflected, so can you see that it now has a, a, <coughs> it now has a soup that's more than the previous soup? Okay, and you can imagine I could move this, I could move this point a little closer and then the former soup would, would still be the, would still be the soup. Uh, similarly, uh, this inf is the same as before. It's the same as before. But do you observe <laughs> that uh, because I put, because the non-positive parts inf was here, I could have moved this green one closer and the new inf could be slightly smaller. Okay. <clears throat> so, so, in this picture, in this picture, what is the oscillation? Right. So this is the oscillation of x. And then what is the, uh, what is the oscillation of absolute value of x <coughs> in this picture? <coughs> Whoa. <laughs> That's what I, my, my pin kind of exploded there a little bit. Uh, so, so th this one is the oscillation of absolute value of x. Okay. Good. So, do we have, can, can someone make a hypothesis about this now? What's going to be the relationship between the oscillation of x and the oscillation of the absolute value of x? Oscillation of absolute value is the difference between the <coughs> Of 
Right. Okay. <laughs> so, so let, let let's be clear. Right. So so what's happening is that the is that here's the oscillation. This is the soup of the original set, and then the soup of the of the absolute valued set is either either going to be this one, or which one, or that one. It's got to be one of these two. The 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 soup. The new soup. <coughs> Similarly, what's going to be the new inf? It's either going to be it's either going to be the the, the old inf uh, or or this one. So let's see if we can if we can write it all down. <laughs> so the oscillation of absolute value of x is going to be what? So what's, what's going to be the furthest point? So it's going to be the maximum of what two things? The ma right, the maximum of soup of x plus. Okay, and the negation of the nth of x minus. Okay, so that's that's the that's the this the this is the soup of the new set and then how do we get the inf of the new set subtract uh subtract what the minimum of x plus very good Okay, that's interesting. So this is, this is the oscillation. And now, the only thing that's going to be important for us is the following. Is that the oscillation of the absolute value of the set is going to be less or equal to what? The oscillation of x. Because when, when, do, we have, when do we have equality? Right, when, 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 the, when x is originally just on one side of the origin, then, then you have equality. Uh, but there's another case where you could have equality. No, is there another case? Whenever the... Uh, no, nah, you couldn't have another case. Uh, so, so, so there's another case, the set that contains only zero. I like it, yes? Right, right, right. It could it couldn't be possibly smaller than than this one or this one. So it's got to be it's got to be at least this much and also at least this much. I agree, because uh, you know it just you just have to consider all possible orderings of these red and green points. The red points could be on the outside. The green points could be on the outside, etc. Good. So now that we've done this, any question about this? This this is the hard part. So now now comes the the, the easy part. So this is all okay? Good. Back to integrals now. So the proposition. <coughs> proposition. So if, so in the first place, one, if f from r into r and g from r into r are integrable. So they're, if they're both integrable, then two, two consequences. F plus G is integrable. So, so far what we're saying is that uh, if you have two integrable functions, then, <coughs> then their sum is also integrable. So this is like saying if you have two integers, then their sum is an integer. Also, do understand that this is a one-way thing because 
if I have two numbers and their sum is an integer, does that mean that each one of those numbers was an integer? No, right? Because say like two and a half and three and a half, their sum is an integer, but, but the individuals aren't. So if you have two integrable functions, then the sum is integrable, and furthermore, uh, the integral of the sum is what? Yes, is the integral of the first one <coughs> plus the integral of the second one. And this is all over Rn. <coughs> so what does this say about, um, about the integral operation? Yes, you have a question? Uh, so just based on your comment, is there such functions that are both not integrable that when add together? Yeah, there, there's, in fact, there's a great many functions, <laughs> neither of which is integrable, but their sum is. A great many of them. Uh, okay, so what, what, is this, what, what is the name of this property? Additivity. additivity. Distributivity, is, uh, that's, that's pretty good. But this is, this is the additivity of the, of, the, of the integral. Additivity. So, so hopefully, at least in my opinion, a good, a good math class, uh, you, you, sh you should be able to predict what the instructor is going to say next. So I'm writing a, I'm writing a proposition that's going to have several parts, and I just talked about additivity. What is the next thing I'm going to say? Homogeneity. Homogeneity. <coughs> right? So if f from R into R is integrable and you have a scalar, your favorite scalar, fixed. Then, again, two comments. AF uh, defined as, uh, defined as uh, in the following way that X uh, maps to A multiplied by f of x, so e exactly, what, exactly what you think, uh, then this is integrable, it is integrable, <coughs> and furthermore, what, it, what is its integral? Right, so the integral of AF is, well, you can factor that A out. So A multiplied by the integral over Rn of F dx. And then, of course, what's the name of this property? <sighs> yep, thank you. <clears throat> what's the name of this property? Homogeneity. So, so, what does this mean about uh, homo homogeneity? What does this say about? Uh, the integral is linear. So it, it's additive and homogeneous. Okay, good. Three. Uh, so if again, we have two functions, f and g, from Rn to R uh, are integrable. And furthermore, and f of x is less or equal to less or equal to g of x for all x. Then what? Yes, then the integral of, of f <coughs> dn x is less or equal to integral g, did I say g? Yeah, g dn x. So there's not really a name for this one 
Uh, but uh, w w what what you would say is that is that the integral preserves order. Okay. Uh, finally, finally, uh, this one. If again, again we have uh, an integrable function. So if f from r n to r is integrable. Then two things. <coughs> then absolute value of f, which is uh, which by that I mean the set which takes f x and map uh, sorry the function that takes x and maps it to absolute value of f of x is also integrable. Now do you understand that this that this does not go. Uh, the other way, which is to say that um, if, if the absolute value of a function is integrable, that does not mean that the original function is, is integrable. And a, a, way, a way to understand that, for example, is that for those of you who took 24, well, everybody took 24, 19, and 24, 15, do you remember alternating series? And do you remember that some, 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 some series were absolutely convergent? Okay, so, um, uh, but that, but, uh, let me see, what am I trying to say? Or am I saying something backwards? Huh. I gotta think about that for a second. No, I'm gonna have to, <laughs> no, I'm gonna have to retract the last two sentences I just said, so that's, that's just right out. Did you have a question? Yeah, I was gonna ask, since we, it's additive and homogeneous, so it's linear. Uh -huh. Does that mean we can represent the integral with the matrix? No. Uh, and the, the, the reason, so that's a, that's a very good question. Uh, the, in the end, the answer is, <coughs> is not really, because uh, to, in, in order to be able to say, if I have a map that's linear, then it's representable as a matrix, then in order to do that, more or less, you need the, the, the problem to be finite dimensional. But functions are not finite dimensional objects. Because, you, because for example, you could consider a vector in R3 to be a function in the sense that uh, you could say, you could plug in one and it gives you the first component. And you plug in two and it gives you the second component. And you plug in three and it gives you the third component. So you can consider a vector to be itself a function. <coughs> but if we take, say, sine of x, how many different things can you plug into sine of x? More than three, anyway, right? You can plug in infinitely many things. So in that sense, in that sense, uh, in that sense, uh, a a function is like, and this this it has scare quotes in it now. A function is like an infinite dimensional vector. So it's a good question. It's a really good question. Uh, and, and the the answer is that only in finite dimensions. Yes. Uh, I was wondering also about representing it as a matrix because, of course, like on the homework or the quiz and things, we had like a matrix where you did have like sine of x or something or e to x in the matrix. So why, like, then we would have an infinitely large number of things you could plug into the matrix. And actually, like we have an expression like two x as a as one of the positions of the matrix. So then that already seems like a great step. Okay, so let me finish this statement, and then I'll, I'll circle back around to this. So, so uh, if, if this function is integrable, then, then so is its absolute value, but it, but it need not be the other way around. And furthermore, uh, we have this, that the absolute value of the integral of Rn, F, absolute, Dn, <coughs> X, like so, so if you, take, if you take the function, which is integrable, and then you take that result and compute absolute value of it, this must be less or equal to integrating the absolute value function. So I'll give big kudos to anyone who can say what this is. So you know the name of this. 
thought they dropped it really close to the Schwartz inequality or something like that. It's close. What is it? It's the triangle inequality. That's what this is. This is the triangle inequality. Now, what this is saying, uh, if you like, it's saying that, well, what if, what if you took a vector and you added up all their components and suppose it had exactly two components? You added them up and then compute absolute value. This one is saying, well, take absolute value of the individual components and then add them up. This is the triangle inequality. Okay, so we're going to go on to, to discuss these uh, in a second. But before I get there, there was a different question, and I already forgot. What was it? It was something about matrices? Okay, so... <coughs> So th this is entirely an aside. So if we have a function that looks like this, f of x and y is equal to, say, 3x plus 4y, uh, and then how about cosine of x, y? So here, here's such a, such a function, right? Okay, now here's the thing. Uh, viewing v f is a function. And x, y, uh, because the, the natural domain of this function is the whole plane, how many different inputs can we give to this function? X, how many different in x, y inputs can we give to it? Infinitely many. Infinitely many. So now, what, what I was saying before <coughs> is I want you to consider, uh, I want you to consider instead, uh, consider your favorite vector uh, 2451. And I want, you, I want you to consider this as a function, consider it to be a function, which, which maps inputs 1 and 2 to the reals, which is to say, I could give this a specific name. V is this. And then I could ask, I could say, well, in a slight abuse of notation, what is V of 1? It's 24. And what is V of 2? 51. And notice that, uh, what did I just do? That's, cra <laughs> that's, cr that's just craziness. I, don't know. I was getting ahead of myself. 2 is 51. Uh, notice that you, in this reckoning, you can't plug in anything else. So the re reckoning this vector to be a function, it only accepts two inputs, one and two. Okay, but this function accepts, and this function f accepts any any number of inputs. Okay, so we can, if, if you have further questions, feel, feel free to ask uh, after class. So, so. <coughs> Um, let's, uh, let's deal with this. <coughs> so which ones, which ones do we want to deal with? Oh, let's see. We spend a lot of time doing that right. stuff. Right, it would be a waste not to do it. <coughs> okay. <coughs> let's do, uh, let's do homogeneity, for example, just as an example. So some proofs. So I'll, I'll omit the proof to number one. Let's go to the proof to number two to show that the, that the integral must be homogeneous. So in particular, what I want you to remember is that ln of f, what is this, the lower sum? <coughs> well, it's the sum over all cubes in what? And dn, <laughs> uh, so d dn. <coughs> so that the dyadic paving of space Rn. So we're, we we've cubed up the whole space, and we're gonna we're going to sum over all the cubes. Okay. Then what are we gonna do? Something times something, right? <laughs> so we're gonna. On this particular cube, on this little cube, because we're computing the lower sum, what are we going to do to our function? We're going to compute little m, 
That is to say, the nth, <coughs> the nth over the cube of our function, f, and then what? The volume of, of that cube. So the, vo the n volume of that cube. So this is the, this is the uh, definition. So in particular, what I want you to see is that uh, because, uh, because our function is bounded with bounded support, there's only, there's only finitely many cubes that matter, which is to say, because it's bounded, you, can, you, could, you could fit all of the non-zero part of f inside of a ball, and there's only finitely many cubes that are in that ball, so infinite, infinitely many of them don't matter. This is, in fact, a finite sum. And because it's a finite sum, we can deal with, uh, we can deal with uh, these, these cubes one at a time. Okay, so let's consider, uh, let's consider, what is the relationship, so one cube at a time. What will be the relationship between, suppose we have such a cube, of M MCF <coughs> versus MCAF. So how are these going to be uh, related? <coughs> so, so which one? Which one's which? So, so what can I do with these? I'm sorry, I couldn't understand. Right. So we could take this A and factor it out. So A, uh, MC of F. So the relationship there is that on a single cube, on a single cube, nth will be homogeneous. And because nth is Inf itself is homogeneous over a single cube, and because there's only finitely many of these, uh, that means that <coughs> that means that uh, we could take the lower sum at, res at resolution n of a f and do what? Right. We could say, okay, well, this is equal to the sum uh, over the dyadic cubing like this. MCAF volume in on a cube. This A can come out. Uh, whoops. A multiplied by, by little m C F volume of a cube. Okay, but now how about how about summation? Is summation homogeneous? It is, right? Except in the particular case of of summation, the ho homogeneity is called <coughs> what? Fishing for a D word. Distributive, right? So then that is to say that the A can now the A came outside of the nth. Now it can come outside of the uh, the sum outside of the sigma. So now it's uh, outside a. Uh, a sum dn mf f volume mc. <coughs> but what is this that I just wrote? This is ln. So this is a ln of f. Ah, so because, because of the homogeneity on a, of, of m, that means that we have homogeneity on a single cube, which means we have homogeneity on all cubes, which means that we have homogeneity of the lower sum. Can, can we agree without further argument that we also have homogeneity of the upper sum? Okay, as a result, if the lower and upper sums both converge, then so does A multiplied by them. Okay, so then, in the end, the homogeneity on a single cube is what's, it's what is what's force. Well, homogeneity of nth and suit themselves is what's uh, what's causing this this whole issue. Good. Any question about this one? <coughs> 
So do we want to do another one? Well, okay. Well, okay. You're, you're right. So, some, something, something weird did happen. Uh, so, no, okay. Let's look at this step right here. <laughs> I even prepared us for it, and then I forgot to mention it. So, so notice, <laughs> notice what happened here. So, here for inf, I factored out a. But something, something funny happens if if a is negative, right? So, in particular, if you factor out negative one, then what happens? Inf becomes soup. Okay, so, so what this what this really is is th this is the case for uh, for a lower sum and a positive and a positive constant. Now, uh, if if a were negative, then the action of factoring out this negative a would what would happen if if I did that? What would this become? Big M. This would become big M, and then as a result, it wouldn't be the lower sum of AF is A times the lower sum of F, what would it be? The lower sum of AF is A multiplied by the upper sum. So, so factoring out would, 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 cause, would cause you to switch to the upper sum. Similarly, from the upper sum to the lower sum. But then, if they both converge, then it all converge by the squeeze theorem. Good. Okay, <coughs> so how about, uh, how about how about number three? And again, let's consider just a single cube in the dyadic in the in the in the dyadic cubing. So number three is the one where we have f is less or equal to g. Okay. Then how about what is going to be the relationship between the nth of uh, of f on on this cube uh, versus the nth of g on this cube? Right. So, so the, the comparison of these, so, the, so, the, so fix, fix your favorite cube, and then the nth of f on this cube has to be less or equal to the nth of g on, on the same cube. So, <coughs> for this reason, that means that the, that, uh, the, the lower sum of f has to be less, at any resolution, has to be less or equal to the lower sum of g at any resolution. Similar things for <coughs> the upper sum, and if they all converge, then, then the integrals exist and still satisfy the inequality. So just considering it on a single cube. Uh, how about the last one? Four, that is to say the triangle inequality. Okay. <coughs> well. Let's consider, again, a fixed cube. So, in particular, what two functions are we considering? We're considering f and absolute value of f. <coughs> so we want to compare f and uh, the absolute value of f. Okay. So let's consider, and this is, this is where, when I was first talking about absolute value of set, and I said just on this page, okay, now we've got to, now we've got to, got to think about it. Okay. In particular, uh, I want you to consider uh, the oscillation, the oscillation over a cube of F, so, uh, of, <coughs> in fact, absolute value of F, and I want you to compare this to the oscillation over a cube of just f. <clears throat> yeah, so which one, which one's it going to be? Yeah, so what, what's happening is that because of that same argument that we made, carefully tracking reflections and things like that, Max, min, min, max, all this stuff. The oscillation on, a on, a, on your particular pixel, on your particular cube of the absolute value function 
of this one, the oscillation must be less or equal to this oscillation. Okay, so in particular, uh, the oscillation over your cube of the absolute value function must be less or equal to the oscillation over that same cube for the original function. But what is, but, but, uh, uh, <clears throat> so in particular, uh, I could ask, well, what is the oscillation? What is the definition of the oscillation? It, it's, bi it's the big M minus the little m, soup minus mph. So, so the, the soup of, oh, over that cube of absolute value f minus the mph over that cube of absolute value f is less or equal to the soup over that cube of f minus uh, the mph over that cube of, of f. So, so this is still the case. Okay, uh, now, this is over one cube. This is over one cube. So, so, na so, so that means that for every one of the cubes, and there's just finitely many of them, where the, uh, where the lower and upper sums are non-zero, we could add up all of these inequalities. We could add them all up. So suppose we, suppose we add each one of these up individually. So just adding, just adding those, what, what are we getting? This is the upper sum for which function? <coughs> for the absolute value function. And what is just this one, adding all of those up? The lower sum for the absolute value function. And what is this one? Upper sum for f. And this is the lower sum for f. So by summing, we could, we could now switch to, to upper and lower sums. Uh, and then we could, we could uh, then, then we would be right on top of the answer. Okay, good. So any question about this? So again, the, the thing I'm trying to get across is you can, is, is the strength of, of this method is you, you look at what's happening on a single cube and then you just start uh, summing it up. Okay, good. Definition. Uh, let, let A be a subset of Rn. <coughs> then uh, A is called, what do they want to call it? Then A is said to have N volume when uh, the characteristic, how did we write the characteristic function a couple days ago? With a one, right? With a chi. With a chi? Okay. So when, when chi A is integrable. So now, that, that being said, uh, that being said, this book writes uh, the characteristic function as a fancy one. So just like just like you have a blackboard bold R to mean the reals, a fancy R for the reals. This this is a fancy one for the for the characteristic function. Okay. So, so what what we're saying is that uh, an n cube has volume, a little bitty cube. It'll be base. Well, it'll be the product of all its dimensions. So, uh, in 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 R one, it's the its length and R2, its area, etc. So what if we have a set, <coughs> what if we have a set, uh, say, in R2, and this is clearly not a cube, <coughs> uh, the question is, is does, it, does it have an area? And how will we compute its area? Yeah, we're going to break it into, into cubes. We're going to break it into cubes, so uh, for example, <coughs> uh, like so.
okay? And supposing we wanted to compute lower and upper sums. Well, for this particular, uh, for this particular drawing that I made, for this particular drawing that I made, which, uh, which cubes are going to contribute to the lower sum for this, for this particular drawing? How can you tell which ones will contribute to the lower sum for this particular dyadic paving? The ones that are completely contained, right? Because remember, what you're doing is over a cube for the lower sum, you're computing inf. You're computing inf. And what does the characteristic function do? How does it, the characteristic function on a set, how does it behave? Right. So we're talking about a function that evaluates to 1 anywhere in the set and 0 outside of the set. So suppose that I single out, say, this, this particular uh, square, this particular cube. So you can see that that, that particular cube is, sum, sum is uh, some of the set is in there, but some of it is not. So what, it, what is the enthemum of the characteristic function? on this cube? Zero. zero, right? Because here it's zero and here it's one. So the infimum, the infimum of the characteristic function will be zero on this cube. What is the supremum? One. one. So for, for that reason, the, uh, for, this per, for this particular uh, drawing, the only cubes that count toward the lower sum would be these, the ones that are entirely contained uh, inside. Your, your, your drawing, of course, could be slightly different. So those are the only cubes that were entirely inside. Which cubes would contribute to the other <coughs> side? Yeah, any cube that, that, that contains any of the set at all. Any of the set at all. So uh, these are the ones that would contribute to the upper sum. And what I want you to see from, from, from this example, <clears throat> I think I just barely nicked that one. Uh, what I want you to see from this example is that which, is that in particular only finitely many cubes uh, are in play. <coughs> so I don't know how many are there, but, but it's finitely many of them. So the reason why finitely, uh, well, the reason why finitely many of them are in play for this particular A is because A is bounded. A is bounded. So, so in particular, uh, you know, we, we, we could get into trouble if, if A was not bounded, like if we, if we uh, made it get very skinny going that way. Yes? Uh, in the screen, we would count the X's and the infimums, infimums of, right? In the, sorry, I didn't understand. Uh, as in the ones we cross-catch for the uh, uh, infimum. Those are also in the supremum. Yes, yeah. yes. Because in, in the end, right, uh, what it, you're going to evaluate to one anywhere inside the set and zero outside. So in, in such a case, in such a case, what is the, what is the volume? Uh, how, how are we going to find, how are we going to define the volume of set A? The integral of what? The characteristic function. Very good. So then the volume, the, vo the n volume of set A is the integral of the characteristic of A dn x. Okay, so last thing that I want to uh, leave you with. So suppose that, uh, suppose that in the plane now, <coughs> in the plane, We've got the diagonal line that goes from 0, 0 to 1, 1. So in the plane now, just the diagonal line. What is the 2 volume? So if, the, if this is set A, my question for you is, is what, is the, what is the 2 volume of set A? What's it going to be? What's the two volume of it? 
Well, like be, beca because we want the two volume of it, we'd have, yeah, we'd have to cover it up with little, with little two cubes, right? With little two cubes. And if we made a very coarse one, then it could be, then, <coughs> then the cubes that would cover it would be like this one, and this one, and this one, for, 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 a, for a somewhat coarse uh, covering. None of the others would count. But do you see that, that the finer we get, we'll cover it with more cubes, but, but the actual area that we take up is less and less and less. So what's going to be the two volume of this? Zero, right? Okay, so such, such sets are gonna, uh, are, are said to have measure zero, and we'll talk about that uh, next time.